Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for our inaugural webinar series. What I'd like to do today is give an overview of the research that we do at the National Acoustic Laboratories. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about this seminar series that we are just kicking off with this presentation. What we plan on doing over the next three months is presenting around 30 or so webinars detailing different aspects of research at NAL. We want to make this widely available around the world, so we're focusing on three different time zones for these presentations in Australia, in the US, and in uh, Europe, so it's convenient for people around the world. These will be high impact, 15 to 20 minute long presentations detailing different aspects of research that we think are important for people who are in hearing healthcare business. You'll get a chance to meet researchers across the organization in different fields talking about the work that they do. Now, one of the reasons that we're doing this is with the current uh, COVID situation, there has been some fairly dramatic changes in hearing healthcare. Uh, a lot of innovation happening, but a lot of uh, transformation in how hearing healthcare services are provided. And a lot of this relates to research that has been done at NAL over the past several years. So we want to share the insights of what we have found and some of the technology that we've developed uh, in this area that we think could be beneficial for people who are uh, changing the services that they provide or the technology that they're developing. But we also want to share other insights that we've gathered with, at, with research at NAL over the past many years, because we think that this can also help with the treatment of hearing health care worldwide. So that's the goal of the seminar series. We hope you really find what we're presenting uh, valuable for you. And by participating, you also get a chance to ask questions of us and hopefully we can uh, build a relationship as well over time. So these are the people that you'll be seeing uh, give presentations over the uh, next three months and you'll get a chance to really to know uh, NEL as well as the people there. So I want to start by talking about who is the National Acoustic Laboratories. So, you know, I've known about NEL almost my whole career. Uh, when I joined NAL two and a half years ago, I really, I did really didn't understand a lot about it, except of course for the fitting prescription and Harvey Dillon and some of the other researchers who I've met at conferences. What I was astounded by when I joined NAL was the breadth of research that they've done and really the incredible work that has gone on for many years at this, this center. So NAL is a government funded research center uh, funded by the Department of Health and has been around uh, for a very long time, over 70 years. And in the US, it'd be very similar to a research center in Bethesda that was funded by the National Institute of Health, for example. Uh, we uh, are made up of over 50 career scientists, a variety of disciplines, audiology, engineering, neuroscience, psychology, speech pathology, all areas that we think are important to understand the needs of those with hearing loss and the solutions that are necessary in order to uh, help them. Uh, we are located in the building that you see here, which is really a beautiful uh, center in Sydney, Australia. Five story building filled with organizations that are all focused on hearing health care, helping people with hearing loss. So it's really a great building to be, a great organizations for us to collaborate with. And most importantly, we are a part of Hearing Australia Services, which is the largest uh, hearing health care provider in Australia, also a government organization. And why this is so critical for the success of NAL is it allows us to work with hundreds of audiologists across the country, well over 100 clinics providing hearing uh, health care services. So it allows us to really understand deeply the needs of people with hearing loss, the needs of clinicians who are treating those clients, and for us to uh, test ideas, test protocols, test technology, uh, and uh, develop our ideas. So this is really, I think, a unique relationship in the world that is uh, uh, valuable for developing new ideas and innovation in the hearing healthcare area. So why, why do we exist? What is that we're focused on doing? Well, our goal is basically in everything that we do to transform the lives of people who have hearing difficulties, whatever those difficulties have. And the way that we do this is not just through research. Research is a very important part of what we do, but also with innovation, which for me, innovation is the creation of things uh, that uh, helps uh, bring value to someone. So here, we have created a lot of technology uh, solutions uh, that have helped clinicians uh, treat clients and have help, helped uh, bring technical solutions to hearing healthcare as well. So uh, it's really uh, more, uh, as much of an innovation center as it is a research center. Uh, and we are a little bit different than research centers that also exist around the world focused on uh, hearing loss and hearing healthcare. 
There are a lot of great departments at universities uh, around the world uh, that uh, do research in this area. We're a little bit different in a variety of ways. One is our main focus for the projects that we do is on the impact that the results of our projects have. So we publish quite a bit. The publications are important, but they're really not the end goal. The end goal is that we're somehow changing the lives of people who have health care in a variety of ways. Uh, we also, uh, all of our projects are done by career scientists. Uh, we don't, we're not a university, we don't have students. And so we've got people who have been doing this for a very long time, are very confident in the plans that they make and in our capabilities and in the goals that we set for the, for the projects that we develop. We work a lot with people who are developing solutions for people with hearing loss. So we work a lot with the major hearing aid companies, with the cochlear implant companies, with a lot of hearing startups. We really want to help anyone out there who is trying to uh, help people who have hearing loss. And over the past couple of years, we have embraced a lot of innovation methodologies that I probably brought with me from Silicon Valley. Things like design thinking, lean startup, minimal mobile products, the agile approaches. Uh, that's really sort of transformed our approach to, um, to the projects that we do. I think making them more effective and more targeted at uh, having that impact that is so important. Uh, for our mission. So most of the projects that we have can be categorized in one of these four areas. So in order to give you an overview of the kind of research that we do, I'm going to just highlight a couple projects in each of these areas, and I think you'll get a very good sense of the kind of work uh, that we do and um, you know, the impact that we're, we have with the research uh, that, we're, uh, that, that we conduct. So one of the things that we want to make sure we're, we're on top of that's all the sort of the, the current trends that are happening in hearing healthcare. We want to be leaders in understanding uh, the benefits of these trends, in understanding what the barriers are, what are the facilitators of success, in order to, to help continue to grow and transform hearing healthcare. So one of the most prominent uh, changes in hearing healthcare over the past few years has been the emergence of self-fitting hearing aids, direct-to-consumer hearing aids, and hearables. So we have had a lot of projects in this area over many years. In fact, in self-fitting hearing aids, we've been focused on this for over seven years. And the results of a lot of this research, which you, you'll hear about more in, in future webinars in this series, is there are a lot of barriers for getting someone to be successful with a self-fitting hearing aid. In other words, there are a lot of ways that people can get it wrong and that people can be unsuccessful. So it's not as simple as just giving someone a hearing aid, giving them an instruction manual, and then they're going to be happy. There are a lot of ways that they can be unsuccessful, and these are outlined here. If we look at the top uh, part, just getting the form factor right, uh, getting the user control interface right for the unique needs of the demographic that we target uh, is critical. Uh, figuring out how are you going to uh, test your hearing, how are you going to incorporate that in the signal processing of the device? How do you instruct people on something as simple as how it fits on the ear or how a tube goes in a canal. All of these are, are critical uh, for success and are ways that people can fail. You'll hear in a future webinar about an experiment that we did where only about 25% of the people that we tested with a self-fitting hearing aid were actually able to fit themselves. But we did understand what were the factors that made them successful, and we'll talk in more detail about that in the future. Uh, we've also tested some self-hearing tests that are available. We tested one app in particular that, that's on smartphones. We brought in some normal hearing people and people with hearing loss, and we tested their ability to self-test their audiogram compared to uh, an audiologist conducted Houston Westlake audiogram. And what we found was a very high correlation between the self-test with the app and the proper in a sound in a soundproof booth with an audiologist with an audiometer. Uh, threshold at the four frequencies that you see here, 500 through 4K, with correlation coefficients ranging from 0.89 to 0.99. So what, what we're seeing is that it's not that the limitations for self-fitting and direct-to-consumer technology is not, the, um, is not the technology itself. It's really uh, the understanding of how to help the client, how to get them motivated, uh, everything that audiologists do so well and practitioners do so well. And you know we have a lot of evidence that demonstrates the value of a clinician to a lot of uh, clients out there. And it's less about the technology and more about uh, the understanding of the unique needs and the unique treatment strategies for that person. And I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, more about that data in, in a bit. Teleaudiology, of course, is, is 
has been an emerging technology for a long time and it's in our face now. Everyone is, is scrambling to embrace it. We've done a lot of research in this area. Two years ago, we did some investigation into the barriers for success for teleaudiology, which included the attitudes and beliefs that people had. And what you're seeing here is just one small bit of the data that we gathered two years ago in this, where we asked audiologists what their opinion was on the use of teleaudiology for a variety of uh, treatment uh, uh, steps for hearing healthcare. And what you can see here is the blue bars are the uh, levels of sort of um, willingness to use teleaudiology if there's an assistant at the far end with the client. The red bars are the level of willingness uh, to use teleaudiology if they're if the client is on their own, if there's no one there to help them. So the first thing you notice, the blue bars are taller than the red bars, meaning that audiologists are happier to use teleaudiology if there's an assistant or less willing to use it if there's no assistant at the other end. You also see that there are some uh, cases where some, some aspects of teleaudiology where audiologists are quite comfortable in using it as a tool, such as when there's information transfer, but when there are things like diagnostics, uh, tests involved, there's a very low level of comfort with the use of teleaudiology. And we have a lot more data on the, on the um, barriers and attitudes towards teleaudiology that we'll share with you in a future webinar. But we're really starting to see these uh, at play in uh, the treatment of healthcare today using remote services. We did a, a, a fairly extensive test of the Resound Remote Assist teleaudiology system. And what we did with a, a treatment group and a control group is we had a control group go through a standard uh, fitting with the device with the fitting and several follow ups. And with the test group, we replaced one of the follow up visits with the remote programming only. And we looked at a variety of aspects of how well was that client treated. We'll get into a lot more of that data in a future webinar, but sort of the headline here you can see on the screen is is most if not all of the people who experienced remote care in that follow up were very, very happy with that. And in other data, we, we, we saw that uh, they actually preferred that over that face to face visit for a variety of reasons. Now there were a lot of uh, of care that was necessary for face to face and we'll, we'll uh, get into the those um, those different nuances of using teleaudiology again at a future webinar. But we're seeing this at play right now. We've we've uh, spent many years trying to develop insight into how best to apply teleaudiology in hearing healthcare. We also spent a lot of time understanding why people make the decisions that they do and what is the best way uh, to treat individuals, what their unique needs are and what unique treatment strategies should be. One of the ways that every field is doing this right now in hearing healthcare and other fields is with the use of big data and machine learning. We're seeing it transform healthcare uh, in a very dramatic way and transforming other fields as well. And so we uh, are starting to invest quite heavily into uh, using big data to understand uh, the unique needs of people with hearing loss. One of the ways that we've done this is we've implemented an online assessment system where people answer a variety of questions about their hearing, about what they're experiencing with their hearing and what their beliefs on hearing and hearing devices are in conjunction with an online hearing test that gives us greater insight to that person which we can then correlate with success with um, treatment strategies. And with that big data analysis, it allows us to, to more uh, specifically target the unique needs of people who have hearing difficulty. In another big data uh, project that we had, we looked at people, we, we gathered data during the fitting process and three months after they were fit with the hearing device in order to understand what are the most important factors to make someone successful with the, with the hearing aid. Uh, here are on the screen are some of the factors that were most important for people believing that they are having success with their hearing devices several months after that, uh, after obtaining them. What's most important, uh, interesting for me is the high, uh, uh, the high loading on clinician interest in terms of what's important in making someone successful with their devices. And this is really shown strongly with this figure where on the Y axis, we see the benefit that the client is reporting with their hearing aid and the Y axis, we see the level of perceived interest or care that they believe they got from their audiologist when they were fit. And here you can see the stronger the level of interest and care that they got, the more happier, the happier they are and the more benefit they're getting from their hearing aids months down the road. So clinicians are really, really important in making people successful with their devices, 
but also in getting benefit from their devices in stark contrast to some of the trends happening now with the direct to consumer hearing aids and the belief that you can just give devices to people on their own and they'll do just fine. There's a lot of evidence uh, that's coming out of this research and others showing the value that audiologists bring to making people with hearing loss successful with their devices. And we'll be talking more about this in future webinars. We've gotten pretty uh, involved in the field of behavioral economics over the last two years. This is an emerging field that is transforming a lot of areas. Now, behavioral economics is the field of understanding why people make the decisions that they do when they seem either illogical, unnatural, uh, irrational, or just unexpected. But there's actually a deep-seated reason that people make these decisions. And a, a simple example is um, sometimes too much choice is a bad thing. If you're looking to buy something, you might think the best thing you could do for someone is give them as many options as possible. And this will actually sometimes freeze people to the point where they won't make a decision at all. They'll just back away, say it's too complicated. I'm actually choosing not to get anything. So sometimes simplifying the decisions help people make a choice. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these factors that go in that are at play when people make choices. So behavioral economics is the field of understanding why people choose the things that they do and then developing nudges, ways that we can get people to make choices that are in their better interest so that they're not influenced by biases, uh, by uh, some inherent thinking that they have by uh, outside influences in those choices. And if you think about hearing healthcare, there are a variety of places in the, in the patient journey where people are making choices about their hearing health, whether it's to go see a healthcare practitioner, whether it's to get a hearing test, whether it's to actually get a hearing aid if it's recommended, uh, which hearing aid to get, whether to actually wear the hearing aid once you've obtained a hearing aid. Uh, there's a lot of places where people are not making the best decisions for themselves. So we want to understand how can we apply behavioral economics in, in order to understand these decisions that are being made and help people make uh, better decisions in hearing health care. One area where we've been successful with this is in the at the point where people are deciding what hearing aid to get. As, as we all know in this field, a lot of people often simply choose the cheapest hearing aid that's available to them. And it's not necessarily because that's the only one they can afford, but sometimes it's because that's the default choice. They, they have a hard time making a decision for a higher level and better technology that can produce better hearing outcomes for them. So our goal was how could we apply behavioral economics to allow people to make better choices for the hearing health care to get better technology and get better hearing el outcomes from those decisions that they're making. So we applied a uh, concept from behavioral economics. We spent months understanding the issue, identifying the heuristics that are involved, the biases. We developed nudges that can help people make better decisions for the hearing health care. And then we developed a protocol that clinics can use in order to get people to uh, get better hearing care. And what we were able to do is to get more than twice as many people uh, make that choice to get better hearing technology and get better hearing uh, for the uh, when when they're seeking to get hearing help. So uh, I think that behavioral economics can be applied in a lot of positive ways, and we're we're heavily involved in this. And you'll hear a lot more about uh, this in our work in helping hearing health care through behavioral insights in future webinars. NAL also develops a lot of technology that we make available to clinicians and to people and to manufacturers of uh, technology in order to help with hearing. Uh, one of the most successful technologies that we developed is an EEG system called HearLab. And this was developed in order to solve the problem of how do you tell uh, how a baby is doing when they're fit with a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. Uh, they can't tell you if they're hearing well or not. They can't do speech tests. So the solution that NAL developed was an EEG system that measures the auditory cortex and is able to tell which speech materials are actually getting to the auditory cortex uh, through the hearing aid or through the cochlear implant that would allow the clinician to make decisions on the amount of gain that the, the baby is getting or whether they should actually switch from a hearing aid to a cochlear implant if they're in that level of hearing loss where it's a little bit ambiguous. So this has been uh, used very successfully with clinics across Australia and around the world. And we have continued to uh, innovate in this area and in areas such as uh, being able to identify um, 
whether babies can differentiate between the different speech sounds. So uh, this is one one of the better examples of technologies that we've developed. Uh, we've licensed this to a diagnostic company called Inventus that will be releasing this in the future. Um, we have developed uh, some automated uh, visual reinforcement audiology systems that is going to be released very soon by Metarex. We've developed apps. Uh, we've developed remote hearing uh, tests and hearing systems. Uh, all things where we're identifying unmet needs of either people with hearing loss or clinician clinicians and developing tools that can help uh, get better outcomes for people with hearing loss. Then finally, NAL spends a lot of time understanding the um, how to measure outcomes of people who get hearing devices. You know, we uh, historically in research spent a lot of time using very artificial tests, whether it's the quick sin or the hint, very simple sentences and very simple noise. We all know that these are not representative of, representative of the real world, and we want to understand better how people are, are doing with their devices. Where are there still gaps? Where, where do they still have unmet needs, even though they've been fit with very good products? And the only way to do that is to be able to test them in the most realistic way possible. And in all aspects of outcomes, not just speech reception, but effort, and uh, comfort and, and uh, a variety of ways, um, social participation. So one, one area that, uh, one project that's been very important for us in terms of outcomes is a, a long-standing study. It's a longitudinal study on outcomes of children fit with uh, devices. So we have been following people, babies who have been born with hearing loss, over 400 babies, who were then subsequently fit with either hearing aids or cochlear implants, and we have been following them throughout their whole lives. So they have reached the age of 10 and older now, and we're tracking things like how they're doing in school, how their speech is developing, how they're socializing, basically any and all aspects of their lives that have been impacted by the provision of hearing devices, and, and seeing what the impact of the devices are compared to children who aren't uh, wearing device uh, have normal hearing, but also uh, seeing what the impact is on the timeliness of the fitting of devices. Because as we know, some people delay in fitting cochlear implants or hearing aids. We wanted to see if that had an impact on how people are living their lives years, years later. And so we're hoping that this data can be used by policymakers and changing policy on uh, fitting babies with devices, on uh, healthcare professionals and the decisions that they make in the clinician. In, in the clinic for the provision of devices for babies, but also for the public awareness for parents and helping them make decisions on whether or not they should treat their children, their children's identified hearing loss. So here's an example of the data that we've found, and you'll see a lot more about this in uh, an upcoming webinar. Uh, here we see on the Y axis is a, uh, is a speech score for how this cohort is doing at the age of five. Um, and what the X axis is uh, the age uh, of the baby when they were fit with their hearing aid. So this is a group of uh, babies who had uh, severe hearing loss, 70 dB HL or, or greater. And you can see with the red line, the trend of the population, that orange area in the middle is the norm for uh, their, their speech uh, production scores, their, sorry, their language scores. And the red uh, line shows you the trend uh, for um, how they're doing as a function of when the hearing aid was first fit. And you can see if they've been fit uh, beyond the first six months of age, uh, as on average, they are doing uh, worse than the normative group shown here. So the age at which someone is fit with a hearing aid is very important from a developmental perspective in terms of language acquisition and their ability to use language years down the road. So well, uh, this is, a, again, one of the more important projects we've done at NAL, and you'll hear more about this at a later webinar. Uh, we spent a lot of time figuring out how can we get most uh, realistic measures of how people are performing with their devices. One way that we're doing this is getting out in the real world and developing technology that people can use uh, to for us to assess how they're doing when they're at restaurants, when they're at social functions, when they're at home, whether these are apps on iPhones or other technology. We are getting out into the real world and trying to get out of the lab to see how people are functioning in their everyday lives uh, with uh, the treatments that they've received, or even to understand the needs of people uh, with untreated hearing loss. We also have very sophisticated laboratory uh, technology that allows us to, to use ambisonics with this 42 speaker system that you see here on the screen. 
that will perfectly provide an acoustic representation of any uh, environment that we've recorded, whether that's a restaurant, whether that's a train station, whether that's a, a store, uh, environments where people might uh, have difficulty communicating, we're able to replicate in the laboratory to get a better understanding of how they're doing with their technology, how they're doing with untreated hearing loss, and uh, again, understand the unmet needs of the population so we can develop solutions for them. One example is we're currently using this technology to uh, allow us to uh, me do measure uh, through e measure EEG uh, in this laboratory using realistic acoustic situations. So see how the brain is responding when people are wearing hearing devices in a very natural, very uh, uh, normal uh, acoustic environment. So this again gives us better insight into uh, the needs of people and also how well technology is doing today in overcoming uh, those needs and meeting, meeting the needs that uh, people have. So that's uh, just a glimpse at the kind of research that we do at NAL. You'll be hearing about each of these projects and a lot more over the rest of this webinar series uh, from uh, the NAL scientists uh, at, uh, at NAL. So thank you. Mm -hmm.